No, I think we're gonna be. I think we're gonna be able to do it, do it well. So let's do a discussion about transient response performance. So. We talked last week about uh, uh, stability, which is the most important performance characteristic of your control system. It better be stable. Um, that's, that's really uh, a pretty, pretty important aspect of most control systems. However, um, past that, obviously you don't want it to be stable and suck either. So you want it to be sta stable and perform well. And so that's what these next two chapters are about. It's the transient response characteristics and then the steady state response characteristics. So systems time responses are often described in terms of two intervals. Loosely defined as transient, the first part, uh, during which the effects of initial conditions remain significant and steady state, the second part during which the response has settled near its final value or final amplitude of oscillation. We're familiar with this idea, of course, uh, but it's good to be reminded. In this chapter, we consider performance in terms of the transient response. And then next, we will consider it in terms of the steady state response, specifically as steady state error. So right now we care about like how we get to the steady state, that transient part, and then um, next chapter we're going to worry about is that steady state a desirable steady state, um, and how do we fix it if it's not. Uh, good, so this is, well we won't talk about how to fix it until the next chapter, but uh, we'll at least be able to identify if it's not performing the way we want. Uh, so transient response characteristics are typically found via two methods, okay? So analytically and numerically are the, are the two methods. And the analytic side has two sort of sub-genres. Uh, so you can do it analytically and precisely for first and second order systems without zeros, okay? So we'll talk about that. Um, how to do it precisely for first and second order systems without zeros, and then you can do it approximately for first and second order systems with zeros and higher order systems that have dominant poles relatively close to the imaginary complex plane axis. Okay, so that's something we'll talk more about. So, what does it mean to be relatively close, um, and when is it valid? When is it not? To use these analytic approximations. And then there's the numerical side, so we can do a simulation too. So those are the two ways we can evaluate how the system uh, transiently responds to some input. The analytical method is especially advantageous for design. Okay? And since we are doing control systems, we are inherently doing design. There's Nothing about control systems um, makes sense unless you're doing design. So uh, design methods, we will learn in chapter 8, require we place the closed loop poles in the complex plane. So we haven't learned yet how to do that, but essentially we're going to be trying to put those closed loop poles in a certain location in the complex plane so that we get these transient response characteristics, okay? And uh, the transient response depends very much on this placement. And exactly how is something we can better understand from studying first and second order system responses. And so that's why we spent so much time on those. We have in the past spent so much time, and then we're going to continue to spend some time today talking about first and second order systems. Um, we can only simulate systems defined by concrete numbers. So simulation, although powerful, is typically more helpful to fine-tune a controller rather than design it from scratch. So we'll talk more about like design algorithms, like how to go through step-by-step -step and do a design. But roughly speaking, we try to 
design based on some analytic approximation. It's typically an approximation. We're usually in 1B when we're doing design, analytic and approximate. So very rarely do we get to be analytic and precise, because not very many systems are exactly first order with no zeros or exactly second order with no zeros. Uh, although it does happen um, relatively, uh, well, not, not too infrequently. Uh, but we're most often in this situation, we have approximately um, these approximate analytic techniques where we can say, okay, we'll design based on this. Eh, it's an approximation, but we'll get close. Okay, we might not get exactly the the transient response characteristics that we are designing for, but we'll get close, and then we can do simulation and tweak things to get even better. So fine tune things with simulation. Um, it's way better than starting out with simulation. And just like randomly stabbing in the dark, okay? That's uh, usually a bad way to go. Um, although some of these some of these tools that we have in MATLAB, which I don't focus a lot on some of these really sexy tools that we have, but um, there are some that allow you to like s place the poles like manually uh, in the complex plane and then see what the step response looks like, like live updating. It's really cool. I'll show it to you guys, but it's not good to rely on that. Um, it's it's uh, pretty cool though, and I do I do and I do recommend learning how to use those tools. Um, but thinking in terms of, of uh, first and second order responses and doing it analytically is actually preferred in in many cases. So that is sort of our introduction to this chapter and the first section or lecture, I'm calling it, um, is the transient response characteristics. And transient response characteristics um, are, there are four of them we're going to focus on. There are others that we won't talk about um, in this class, but these are the four that are the probably the most uh, commonly discussed and the most important. Um, and all of them happen to be defined in terms of a system's step input response. So the step response is useful because it gives us a, uh, a difference between um, where the system is now and where uh, it's going next. And so it gives you a nice transient. It, it responds in a, in a certain way. And we've defined all of our stuff in terms of this step response. Uh, we could have done ramp response, or we could have done impulse response, or we could have done something like that. But um, this is the one that has sort of, sort of been a convention. So that's what everybody uses to, to talk about transient response characteristics. Of course, any input you have is going to have some transient response. We had to pick something to be like a standard input to give us some transient responses that we could discuss um, all in, you know, in a sort of conventional way. So that's what we use. Um, and for the following, so the four definitions here uh, refer to the figure below. So we'll sort of bop back and forth. So first off is the rise time. Okay, TR is usually how we denote it. Whoa, big fat pen. <laughs> rise time, uh, is the duration from the time the response reaches 10% to the time it reaches 90% of its final value. Okay, So uh, if we were to come down here, the rise time is the time it takes to go from, so here's 10% of the final value. Final value we're denoting Y steady state, YSS. Um, to go from 10% to go to 90%. So the time on this graph, I just did a, a sort of sample um, or example um, response, step response. Uh, so the time it takes to go from 10% to 90%. So it's this duration here, TR. Okay. So that roughly gives you like how 
how fast this thing is responding. Okay. Um, okay. So there's one characteristic. The peak time, TP, is the time at which the response reaches its first or maximum peak. So in this situation, it is so this is the the peak value, I called it yp. Um, the time at which it reaches that is tp. And um, this is assuming that time when this step response started is at zero. If you don't have zero here, if your initial time is like five seconds, you have to you have to consider this to be an interval from five to TP. But usually we think of the initial time as being zero, so we don't worry about it. It's hilarious when my hand gets close to this. Gross. Donald Trump should use webcams. Um, I can I can make fun of him for small hands because I have small hands too. So like I don't even feel bad about it. I make fun of him for having small hands. That's cool. I also have small hands. Plus he's fun to make fun of. So we have ourselves a uh, uh, peak time as well. And notice that <laughs> a, we're quite, kind of hedging here on this definition. Say first or maximum peak. So it just so happens that most of the time, much of the time, we have systems that have its, its first peak happens to be its largest peak. Okay, um, That's usually the same thing. If that's not the case, if like your second peak is the highest peak, then you have to decide <laughs> which way to go with your peak time definition. And that's, there's no very, to my knowledge, there's no real uh, good uh, convention on that. You can, you can just define it. It's like, this is the second peak. Just say it. Just be clear about it. Okay. So usually you don't have to worry about it. Usually they're the same peak. Uh, three, the third one, is percent overshoot. Okay. And actually three and four are the ones that I would say are uh, more commonly used. The first two are less commonly used. The, 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 the latter two are more, more commonly used. So the percent overshoot expresses the amount the response overshoots its steady state value. Okay. Expressed as a percentage of the steady state value. So down here, we have this overshoot that happens because the steady state value is down here. Okay. That's where it settles down to. So it obviously overshoots. The amount that it overshoots is yp minus y steady state. And if you divide that by y steady state, you have a fractional um, uh, overshoot. But if you want to have a percent overshoot, then you have to multiply it by 100. I'm not a huge fan of the percent being in the definition. Not what I would like. It's not very clean. Um, however, that is the standard, so we're going to use it and just stick with the crappy convention. So, percent overshoot though, very commonly used because, so for instance, if we we're doing kefir temperature control, if, our, if we overshot the temperature we're aiming for, significantly that could be a problem. So say we want to heat it up to like 74 degrees, but we don't want to go above that, or maybe we can go to 75, safely, but like 77 and like the wrong kind of bacteria grows or something, I don't know, say that happens, then you have to really worry about percent overshoot. And then other applications, like, have you guys ever been in an old elevator that has overshoot? Yeah, it is uncomfortable when you get to that level and you go, Ooh, that's not cool. People dislike that feeling. I dislike that feeling. Um, so, for some applications, having overshoot is, is bad. And some of them, you can have some 
usually there's a trade-off between how fast you get there and how much overshoot you have. Okay. All right. Now the settling time is the last one that we'll discuss. TS, um, and it is the time at which the response reaches and thereafter remains within plus or minus two percent of its steady state value. Okay. So in this figure, I drew this uh, uh, gray band here, huh? something like that, between the steady state plus 2% and the steady state minus 2%. And you see that, OK, it reaches within that, and then it leaves. So that's not right. And then it leaves again. Leaves again. Okay, this is the last time that it comes in the interval and doesn't leave. Okay, so that is our our um, settling time, and it gives us a sort of uh, metric for for a system coming to rest, settling down at a at a point. And the two percent window is just a convention. Okay. So that is um, the transient response characteristics. Are there any questions on that? Or does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about what about it now? Oh, for thinking about it in terms of uh, an LED light controlling an LED light. Yeah, so this these definitions apply to any system. So it might, I mean, the response might not look like this. This is just an example response. But if, you know, if you had some other response, I'll use a different color. Um, if you had some other response that looked like, like this, that would be a weird one, but it could look like that. And you could still apply these definitions to this system. Like this would be the peak. Um, so this would be the peak time. The rise time would still be defined between you know 10% and 90%. The steady state, you have to wait until, you know, maybe it stays within those bounds hereafter. So this would be the the um, the uh, settling time here. And uh, percent overshoot, you could use this peak and then the steady state here. So, so yeah, so there's, um, it, it applies to any systems like driving an LED, all kinds of stuff. You can, I mean, any system that you want, they all have step responses. And so you can apply these definitions to any of these systems. We're going to, and that's a good question because we're going to turn our, our focus in a moment to first and second order systems specifically, and that is uh, something that um, we don't want to get too, too uh, uh, focused on first and second order systems and forget that these apply to all systems. Okay, but you're right, they do, they apply to any system. Okay, so 